once again. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today's webinar is on right to repair. We appreciate you taking the time despite your schedules and time zone contingencies. Um, so this is hosted by East Towards, the certification program for responsible and ethical recycling of electronic waste. The right to repair webinar will be presented to you today by our speakers, starting with Kyle Wyans, CEO of iFixit, and uh, he's also the leader of the Right to Repair campaign. Uh, followed by him, Dr. Elizabeth Chamberlain, Director of Sustainability for iFixit will present. And finally, Kerry Sheehan, and she's the Policy Director and a Right to Repair Advocate with iFixit. So uh, all participants will be muted through the webinar and we will open up the forum for questions at the end. And if you have a question, uh, you can type that in in the chat window and we will address them once the webinar is complete. Um, otherwise, at the end of the webinar, you can raise your hand. Um, that's beside the participant uh, button and you will be unmuted and you can ask your question. So thanks everyone. Now over to Kyle. Thank you very much. Uh, really excited to be uh, with all of you today. Uh, we've got, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce all of you to the amazing team that we have at iFixit working on all of these issues. Um, yeah, all to, what we, we're faced with this problem that we did not create, right? We have products out there. Some of them are designed to be uh, recycled and repaired and some are not. Um, and uh, so it's up to kind of all of us to deal with that, whether, whether it's easy to fix things or not whether it's easy to recycle things or not, uh, we have to manage uh, the process. So uh, background on iFixit, you know, we're the open source free repair manual for everything. Our goal is to teach all of you how to fix your stuff, whether it's you individually with a smartphone that you want to repair or put a new battery in, or if you're a, a large scale recycler refurbisher, uh, we've got, you know, training and information to help your staff learn how to fix things. Fundamentally, we're all working toward the same thing. We want to move from a linear economy where we dig things out of the ground, make stuff out of them, use them for a little while and toss them away, which is the typical, uh, <laughs> that's the typical American uh, consumption uh, uh, you know, system that we've been successfully exporting to the rest of the world. How, how do we turn that into something that's a little bit more circular where we're more efficient with resources? Um, and of course, you know, recycling is great, but there are, there are elements where we just fall short in recycling. I have uh, right here, so this, this photo is of the uh, only rare earth mine in North America. Uh, you know, the neodymium and the magnets of this phone uh, come from a mine like that or a much more polluted mine in China. Uh, and we're not currently, nobody is recovering uh, these rare earths at scale uh, from, from electronics yet. So uh, recycling is, is a piece of it, but we also need to focus on life extension and reuse. And of course, you know, the closer that you stay to the user, the more, the more profit opportunity there is for, for uh, recyclers and refurbishers. You're going to make a lot more money uh, fixing and reselling this thing than you are, you know, scrapping it and extracting the, the commodity value out of it. So that's high level. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, enable the, the circular economy. And, and we think of iFixit as providing you know, the information and tools uh, needed to uh, kind of facilitate every stage of this. We have a vision of a world where things are fixable. Unfortunately, that's not the direction that, that we're moving in now. And I think this cartoon is probably, uh, maybe hits a little bit home, uh, cl close to home for a lot of us because uh, these are, this is what we're dealing with day to day. So what would it look like to go back to a world where we had you know, local repair and products lasted longer? Um, uh, this is, it comes from an Illinois economic study. Uh, I think um, this is kind of uh, speaking to the choir with this group. Of course, you know that that if we you know treat the resource more intensively, uh, we're gonna we're gonna capture more value. Just to kind of put this in context, uh, Apple pays Foxconn to manufacture a phone like this. They pay about five dollars in labor, um, upfront manufacturing. So bringing these jobs back, you know, to uh, to to North America or Europe, uh, you're not going to create a huge amount of economic value. But if you can if you can repair or re resell, if you're refurbishing this phone. Let's say it's it's five years old. You refurbish it. You sell it for fifty dollars. A substantial portion of that goes to labor uh, here at home. So that's an exciting story for politicians. Uh, I want to talk uh, very briefly about some of the challenges that we're having with physical product design, and then I'm going to pass it off to Elizabeth, who's going to talk uh, through you know some of the e-waste challenges that we're seeing. And then Carrie uh, has the exciting job of talking about uh, the solutions and and, and where where right to repair is going and what we're working on from a policy perspective. Uh, so, 
products, consumers don't have the information that they need to uh, buy good products. So uh, a lot of folks would look at this new computer, this is Apple's latest iMac and say, hey, how cool is that? It's super thin. And um, you know, we're looking at, it, the recycler might be looking at it and saying, hey, great, you made it you know, way less, so there's less commodity value. I look at it and say, you know, are, are you gonna be able to upgrade the storage in this thing? Did we go from a computer that was you know, designed to last for a decade or two to an appliance that maybe lasts for a couple of years? And so then we take it apart and we look inside and realize, yeah, actually there's a lot of problems and it's not just us realizing this, this is the Washington Post talking about it. Here's the inside of this thing and they have integrated the storage, they've integrated the RAM, uh, the fans in here, fans are a mechanical component, they wear out over time. Apple doesn't have a plan to replace that. They would say the life of the device is limited to the life of the fan. Um, so this is kind of a ludicrous product design. This is not a product I would recommend anyone buy for themselves, uh, but of course we're going to get them whether we like it or not in the waste stream. So how do we manage that? And this is particularly a challenge when you get products that, are, that have batteries integrated. Um, so uh, th this product gets a two out of 10. If you're curious how I fix it rates products, you can go on ifixit.com and hit our repairability ratings and see different products uh, listed by their rating. Um, this is a product that we really don't like uh, at all. This got scored even lower than the iMac. Uh, and the reason is we, we popped it open or we tried to pop it open, we couldn't find any screws. Turns out the whole thing was glued together. Uh, we had to actually cut it open. Uh, and the process of getting into an original Surface laptop to get the battery out, is very painful and difficult. Um, and so this is uh, finally fully disassembled. This is how you get a zero out of 10 on our scorecard. Um, and then this is fortunately, uh, and I wanna kind of share a story of hope here because it's not just products are getting thinner and thinner. Actually, we're seeing some manufacturers turn around and, and do, do things better. And I'll share why in a little bit. Uh, but this is Microsoft's latest Surface design. They have screws underneath the feet. You can pop the whole thing open. Uh, and that's how you get a five out of 10. So Microsoft went from a zero out of 10 on one product generation to a five out of 10 on the next one. Uh, and that doesn't happen by accident. That was very intentional on their part. And we're definitely seeing increased interest. I got an email yesterday from a major OEM saying, hey, how can we make our products uh, more repairable? So I fix it works behind the scenes to help consult with companies and help uh, make things better. There's been increasing interest in this in actually improving product design because of this little logo. This is the new French repairability scoring. Uh, and, and this uh, little sticker has to go next to the price at retail in France. So if you go to apple.fr and you go to buy an iPhone right next to the price on apple.fr is the price and then you have the repairability rating. And this is a rating from one to 10 of how easy or hard it is to fix. It includes things like spare parts availability, uh, pricing of components, availability of service manuals, unfortunately just in French <laughs> um, uh, for these five product families. Uh, and it's really starting to have an impact. You can see if you're if you're at retail and you're thinking about buying a product and it's got a big red sticker next to it, maybe you're less likely to buy it. Uh, and and the data bears this out. This is a survey that Samsung ran uh, where they were investigating customer reaction to this new scorecard. And you can see 80% uh, uh, 80 of, of French people over 50 have heard about it. Um, and then of those 86% say that the index is impacting their purchasing behavior. Uh, and this is starting to drive manufacturer change. So if you feel like there is no hope, these devices are getting you know, thinner and thinner and glued together, uh, and there's nothing we can do about it, well, we can do something about it. The French government is, is starting, and then Europe has announced that they wanna look into doing something like this Europe-wide, which is very exciting. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Elizabeth to uh, walk us through kind of <laughs> what she's seeing out there. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks to eStewards for making this happen. Um, I'm Liz, I'm the iFixit's Director of Sustainability, and I'm going to talk to you about why right to repair is an e-waste recycling issue. And with most crowds, I'd, I'd want to start with why e-waste is a problem. Uh, I, I bet that many of you in this crowd could recite the facts along with me, things like the fact that we're, we're generating 53.6 million tons of e-waste every year worldwide. That's 50 times heavier than the weight of all the blue whales in the world. Um, the fact that e-waste contains toxic materials, things like mercury, lead, lithium, things that leach into our groundwater and into our soil. Um, and that the, the, the toxic consequences of e-waste are disproportionately felt by people in the global south. Uh, you folks know all that, so I'm not gonna, not gonna linger on that too long, um, especially those of you who've been following e-stewards for a long time. So instead, I'm gonna focus on what repair has to do with e-waste recycling. 
Um, so the main goal of e-waste recycling is to save the energy that goes into mining and manufacturing electronics. And recovering those materials is super important. Many of them are finite resources. They're often extracted in toxic and dangerous ways. But repair saves even more energy than recycling because there's a lot of energy that's embodied in your electronics. And what I mean by that is that shaping all of the aluminum and the chromium and the glass in your phone takes a lot of energy, like a lot, a lot, like 73 times as much energy as it takes to charge that same phone for a year. So even if we have perfect materials recovery and recycling, when you grind electronics up and you do that shaping again, you waste all of the energy that went into turning raw materials into a screen and a Wi-Fi antenna and so on. Repair keeps as much of that energy embodied in the device as possible. And that's why on Earth Day, we tell people not to recycle. And that, that doesn't mean never recycle. That doesn't mean recycling is bad. It just means that recycling should be the last resort. Uh, and before we get to that point, the point of recycling, we should be using our stuff for longer. We should be keeping it working for longer. And repair is a huge part of how we do that. And by the way, we definitely don't have complete materials recovery and recycling. Um, in fact, half of the metals in your phone have functional recycling rates under 50%. That means that metal is, is pretty much being lost in the recycling process. We can recover a lot of the zinc and copper in your phone, but the barium and lithium are gone. So the second reason that right to repair is an e-waste recycling issue comes from recycling facilities themselves. Um, some of you who are recyclers maybe know this already, but for everyone else, when recyclers work to get all those metals out of electronics, they send devices through a big shredder, which is a machine about the size of a semi truck with big metal teeth that grind the electronics into little pieces. And that's, that's what's pictured here. Um, if there's a lithium ion battery in there when the, the teeth meet, uh, it can start a fire. And this has been happening more and more. Recyclers try to remove the batteries before devices get to the shredder, but it's getting harder and harder to do that. More and more of the fires, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Fire Rover, which sells fire suppression systems to, to waste and recycling facilities, reports that there have been over 300 recycling facility fires in the last three years, each of the last three years in the US and Canada. Um, and based on this year's fires so far, they're anticipating that there will be about 400 fires this year. And more and more of these fires are being caused by lithium ion batteries, according to a report by the US Environmental Protection Agency last month. Not only are these fires dangerous and expensive for recycling facilities, they're also an environmental horror. When a shredder goes up in flames, all those toxic materials are released into the air. We may not be burning wires like they do in Ghana scrapyards, but with every battery fire, we're burning electronics just the same. So, why are batteries getting harder to remove? Um, in part, it's, it's because there are more of them. More and more of our devices have batteries in more places. Sometimes those batteries are small and hidden and non-obvious. Um, but, but also increasingly manufacturers are gluing batteries in and Kyle talked about this a little bit. Um, since late 2012, all MacBook Pros have had glued in, mat in batteries. Uh, our process for removing them involves injecting adhesive removing liquid under the battery, sliding string or dental floss like this in the picture underneath it, and then using soft picks to pry it out. Right to repair legislation discourages glue as a fastener for exactly this reason. And it's not just the battery. On the 15, 15 inch touch bar MacBook Pro, everything is glued together, the keyboard, the battery, the speakers, the touch bar. Um, it's such a mess to repair that we give it a one out of 10 repairability score. Now, I want to be clear, this doesn't mean it's impossible to repair. As long as you've got two hands or one hand and a friend to help, you can do it. Uh, we sell kits to make it as easy as possible. When your battery stops holding a charge, Apple wants you to buy a new computer, and you don't have to do that. But as more and more of these computers reach the end of their life and end up at recycling facilities, recyclers are going to have a big problem. Breaking stuff down at a recycling facility has to happen fast. They see so much stuff, such a volume of stuff. They don't want to be fussing with something that takes injectable adhesive and dental floss and a lot of prayers, a lot of patience. They also can't be fussing with weird screws. And more and more electronics have proprietary screws to make it just a little harder for you to get inside your stuff. Apple started this with the pen lobe screw. Um, it's perfectly designed so that if you stick a Torx driver in there, you're going to strip it and have to drill it out. MacBooks all have these. So do iPhones, uh, every iPhone since the iPhone 4. Uh, and we, we worked when these came out with our tool manufacturer to reverse engineer them and make a penelope driver, something that'll let you take these screws out without stripping them. Until then, the only people that had those, those drivers were Apple repair techs. 
by making it just a little harder for you to get inside your stuff, Apple makes you more likely to go to go to them for repair, which of course makes them money, or buy a new device, which of course makes them even more money. The really dangerous thing about this though is that other manufacturers are looking at Apple's success at monopolizing the repair industry for their stuff. And they're saying, hey, that looks like a pretty good idea. So more and more devices have their own special proprietary screws. The Jura copy maker, that's what's, what's pictured here, for instance, they have these weird irregular oval screws. Um, and just like the Penelope, until some independent repair techs reverse engineered it, only official Jura repair techs could get into it. Can you imagine how hard recycling would be if all devices were like this? If you needed to reverse engineer every new device, get a new tool to remove its screws. Um, and that's why, of course, right to repair legislation mandates standard fasteners. The third reason that right to repair is an e-waste recycling issue is that repair business is good business. And recyclers can really easily add repair to what they do to get even more value out of the waste stream. This is Jessa Jones of iPad Rehab. She runs a really successful electronics repair business. She's not just swapping parts, they're actually doing board level repairs. She taught herself micro soldering and she's so convinced that anyone can do it, so convinced that there's enough business to go around that she trains up new micro solderers at a training camp. That's what this picture is from. What, what business is so robust that it can actually train up its competition? Re well, repair is, of course. Um, lots of recyclers already do a small amount of this. Most recyclers do at least a small amount of it. Um, refurbishing old but working devices, wiping them, cleaning them, and reselling them. Um, ERI calls their division that does this the remarketing division. Um, but recycling facilities are full of people who know how electronics work, and there's no reason why they can't do more repair. And I'm, I'm talking here to, to those of you who are recyclers especially. Um, lots of electronics that come through recyclers' doors would be worth more, both to recyclers and to the planet, if, uh, if we spent just 10 minutes or 15 minutes of repair time instead of just running those things through a shredder. Some recyclers actually offer repair services to the public and uh, Homeboy Electronics Recycling in, in Los Angeles does this. And because Homeboy has a repair crew on staff, when they find almost working electronics in the waste stream, they can repair them and then resell them. And they, they sell them through their own website as low cost computers. Um, Brian Fox from Homeboy, he tells me that the, the repair arm of their facility is way, way more profitable than the rest of it. He says most of their revenue actually these days comes from repair even though they started out as an e-waste recycler. We think that every recycler, every e-waste recycler should also be a repair facility. But if we don't pass some robust right to repair legislation, that's gonna be increasingly difficult. Without right to repair legislation, even the basic functions of e-waste recycling are gonna be harder and harder. And we can't trust manufacturers to do the right thing for the planet. Those of you who follow e-stewards know that. The environment needs a watchdog. And that's why we're pushing so hard for right to repair legislation. And I'm, I'm gonna hand it off to Carrie now, our, our policy director to, to tell you more about that work. Uh, can I get control over the slide deck, please? Um, well, I can't, <laughs> it seems I can't control the slide deck, but uh, if we could go to the next slide. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Carrie. I'm the policy director at iFixit, which means I work with governments and social movements around the world to create repair friendly policies and laws. Uh, and I'm going to give you an overview of what we at iFixit have been working on, as well as what you can do to get involved. Uh, but first, I'll just reiterate, you know, why do we need these repair friendly laws and policies? It's because manufacturers, as Liz and Kyle discussed, are increasingly locking out independent repairers through specialized hardware and through restricting access to things like repair information, schematics, uh, service manuals, uh, restricting access to replacement parts, and using specialized software tools that they only share with their branded repair technicians uh, and that they don't share with any independents or device owners making repair of your devices impossible without those tools. Uh, next slide, please. Related to what we've talked about with repairability and design for repair, governments around the world are now responding to right to repair movements demands for action. In the U.S., the first auto right to repair law was passed by a ballot initiative in Massachusetts by an overwhelming 87.7% of voters. 
that sparked a national movement to expand right to repair into other markets like consumer devices, tractors, and medical equipment, and to other states. In 2021, 27 states, more than half the country, introduced right to repair laws that would make it easier for ordinary people and independent repair professionals to fix their devices by requiring manufacturers of electronic devices to provide the same access to parts, tools, and information that they provide to their own branded repair services. If you look at the last four years, that's 40 states in the US that have introduced right to repair laws. And this year, next slide please, and this year, a federal right to repair bill was also introduced in Congress that, very similar to the state laws, again, would require manufacturers to provide access to parts, tools, and information. Uh, Massachusetts also passed a, uh, another uh, right to repair updated law in 2020 uh, that would, uh, again, by you know, over 75% of the voters, uh, would require manufacturers to provide access to specialized vehicle telematic systems that are now becoming increasingly common in cars. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The US Federal Trade Commission has also taken action on repair restrictions. I'm sure you've all seen these warranty void if removed stickers on some of your devices. Well, there's a federal law, the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, that prohibits manufacturers from voiding your warranty simply because you've opened and fixed your device. Uh, and in 2018, next slide, please. The FTC uh, sent several letters to companies who were using these stickers, warning them against using them and against claiming that they would void a warranty uh, for, for independent repair. Uh, if you see these stickers or if a manufacturer tells you they're going to void your warranty uh, for using independent repair, you can report that at reportfraud.ftc.gov. It's a pretty common practice, even though it's illegal. A survey by US Perg found that 43 out of 50 appliance companies said they would consider voiding a warranty for independent repair. Next slide, please. I fix it also worked with our allies uh, and urged the FTC to take stronger action on unfair repair restrictions through the FTC's 2018 workshop on repair restrictions called Mixing with Fix. And this year, next slide, please. The FTC produced a landmark and, and rare unanimous report uh, supporting right to repair. The FTC thoroughly uh, investigated the manufacturer's arguments in favor of restricting the fair and found them to be pretty bogus. Uh, they found that these arguments about safety, about repair quality, et cetera, were not backed by any actual evidence. Uh, next slide, please. And that the manufacturers themselves were causing some of the same problems that they claim to be concerned about by using these repair restrictions. Next slide, please. As you can see, this was kind of a banner gear for right to repair. <laughs> and manufacturers really need to face the idea that right to repair is inevitable. Uh, next slide, please. But if there was any doubt, this year also saw a groundbreaking endorsement of right to repair by the Biden White House, who in an executive order issued in July, urged the FTC to move quickly to address these unfair practices. The FTC followed that up with another unanimous policy statement, pledging the agency to use its resources to go after these manufacturers and prioritize enforcing against unfair and deceptive practices. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We're also fighting to fix copyright restrictions that let manufacturers lock you out of your device software and keep you from fixing it. Uh, so there's a, a kind of obscure provision of copyright law called Section 1201, uh, which provides protection to legal protection to uh, what's called technological protection measures or digital locks. So that part of the law says if, if a manufacturer uses a digital lock to keep you out of, out of your software, uh, that they can, and you try to get around that digital lock, you circumvent it, uh, the manufacturer can then sue you. Uh, there are substantial civil damages and even potential jail time uh, for violating that law. Uh, there is a triennial process uh, that the Copyright Office runs in the U.S. for getting exemptions to that law, and I fix it's been fighting in that process for uh, almost a decade uh, for exemptions to fix everything from tractors to medical equipment to uh, ordinary consumer devices. And this year, we're expecting to see a, uh, a federal bill in Congress that would that would create a permanent reform to this law that would say that you know, repair is never illegal under copyright law. It's pretty absurd, right, that 
that uh, copyright law would prevent you from fixing your tractor. Uh, so, uh, and this is something that's that's a much outdated, a much um, long awaited fix, and we're really excited about it. So, uh, one way that, that you can help, uh, we talked about the state bills, we talked about a uh, forthcoming copyright bill and the federal bill, is call your legislators and representatives. They really do listen to their constituents. Uh, and it can really make a difference. So uh, if you call your state reps, you can go to repair.org uh, slash stand up, the hyphen between stand and up, and uh, that will take you to a state list where you can get in touch with your state representatives. Uh, and you can call your congressional representatives directly. Uh, the, the two bills that we're talking about are in the US House of Representatives, uh, so I would prioritize those. Uh, beyond the US, next slide, please. Governments in Europe, Australia, and Canada are uh, also responding to their constituents and responding to right to repair movements uh, and taking action in favor of right to repair. So as, as Kyle mentioned, the French government passed a law in January that required the that requires the labeling of products with their repair score. Uh, the European Parliament voted in favor of um, mandatory labeling and adopting that on an EU-wide scheme. Uh, we're expecting to see the EU take up mandatory labeling for devices like cell phones and or smartphones and tablets uh, in the near future. Uh, the EU also passed eco-design regulations requiring manufacturers of certain devices to provide access to parts and tools to professional repairers. Uh, and so right to repair is sweeping the EU at the moment. Uh, and next slide, please. Earlier this year, the Australian government, uh, the Australian Government Productivity Commission also released a draft report on right to repair uh, and sought comment. I fix it uh, participated in this process. We testified in this hearing uh, and we're eager to see the final report, which should be coming out in October and hopeful uh, to see some recommendations in the draft report uh, that that encouraged right to repair, encouraged reform to Australia's copyright law, which is quite similar to that in the US uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. Not to be left out, Canada is also getting into right to repair. Uh, and, and earlier this year, Brian, private member Brian May introduced a bill that would update Canada's copyright law, again, very similar to the copyright restrictions and the protection of digital locks that we have in the US. Uh, and, and Brian May's bill would uh, create a kind of permanent uh, permanent exemption for uh, getting around digital locks in favor of repair. The Canadian government is also conducting an open consultation on modernizing Austro uh, uh, Canadian copyright law, uh, including by uh, protecting, protecting your right to repair your software enabled devices. Uh, so that's, that's, um, that's my section for today. I, I will uh, encourage you again to go to repair.org uh, slash stand up. Um, if you're in the EU, repair.eu has a lot of great repair information about the right to repair movement there. If you're in Canada, it's canrepair.ca. Uh, and I believe there's an Australian repair, uh, Repair Australia website launching uh, very soon uh, where you can learn more about that. But we also recommend uh, Mended Australia and Choice Australia have been active players in pushing for right to repair in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Kyle, Liz, and Kerry for this wonderful session. Uh, we will now open the forum for participant questions. If you would like to type that in, feel free to type the question in the chat window. Otherwise, please raise your hand so Angelo can unmute and your question can be presented. Yes, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Use that little uh, hand raise function next to the control panel, and then I will unmute you. Uh, you can also use the chat or um, the questions panel. We do have one questions here. Uh, the question is, are you aware of perhaps or involved in any ISO initiatives uh, pertaining to sustainability? And, um, maybe if you could provide a little bit more clarification there. By ISO, do you mean like like sustainability standards work? Um, there's lots of sustainability standards under development at any given time. Uh, I mean, I can so it, broadly with related to right to repair and standards, uh, there is um, there are a variety of U.S. standards uh, under the EP umbrella. There's a UL standard. There are a number of IEEE standards. Um, 
if, if you're interested in, in repairability as a standard, uh, there is a uh, Senelec uh, EU standard called uh, PR colon EN colon four five 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 four. That's a fantastic standard. Uh, but I don't know of any uh, ISO uh, you know, standards specifically under the ISO umbrella. Great. Uh, but yeah, if you can uh, clarify your questions, that would be great. Uh, we do have a question. There's also oh. um, the TCO certification. So there is an oh, yeah. independent. Yeah. Kyle, you want to talk, mention that email? Yeah, TCO is a is a fantastic uh, uh, standard organization, and they are probably my favorite. If if you're saying, hey, you know, I'm an institutional purchaser, how do I make sure I buy things that are better, that are going to be uh, easier to repair and recycle? Right now, TCO is the best standard that we recommend, and you can go and, and uh, on tcocertified.com and look up laptops and see if they're TCO certified. And there actually are some repair friendly requirements in there where uh, EP, uh, the US EP standard is not one that we can recommend at this point. Uh, we do have a mention here from Jason about ISO 14001 and ISO uh, yeah. 50001. Yeah, um, which are broad environmental standards. They're great, they're great standards. Uh, and they're uh, any e-stewards uh, <laughs> member uh, is probably already certified to those. They're great standards. They don't specifically weigh in on, on repairability or, or product design. They're just like, is your is your organization operating in an environment, uh, environmentally you know, safe way? Great. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, so asking about when you'll get the audio and video for this presentation, that will be available uh, shortly after the presentation via email uh, and as well as on our website at eStewards.org. Uh, we have- uh, And I would say uh, we tried to uh, substantially use screenshots of uh, you know, information that's on the internet. So uh, we were kind of taking on a whirlwind tour of, I would say most of the resources that you got were either from ifixit.com in the right to repair section or repair.org, or do a Google News search for right to repair, and you will find lots of interesting things happening just about every day. Fantastic. Uh, we're getting a bunch of questions streaming in. So we have Jim asking here, besides writing our congresspersons, are there any other actions we can take? That's a great question. Uh, so definitely writing your congresspersons is a great one. Uh, but I would also say if you've experienced, again, uh, warrant these claims that someone will void your warranty, if you open your device or fix it yourself, uh, you should report that to the FTC. Uh, if, you've, if you've experienced other unfair repair restrictions, report that to your FTC. Uh, you can also, you know, join the repair cafe movement or fix it clinics and start local repair events in your communities. I think, you know, one of the one of the struggles that we're having here is we really need to change the culture in order to change what we can repair. And we need to bring back the culture of repair that was that was very common for many of us uh, for a long time. And so. Um, Starting and hosting local repair events or engaging in local repair events in your community uh, can really help uh, build up people's interest in repair and remind people that that, that we can fix our things. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we have a question here from Mark uh, asking, how do repairability methodologies used by iFixit compare to Senelec or other method uh, methodologies? Sure. Yeah, a good question. Um, we're really just at the beginning of repairability scoring um, uh, standards. Uh, so I fix it. We've been you know, scoring products. We've been doing this for well over a decade. I remember when the iPods came out back in the day, we would score them from one to 10. And of course, we've evolved uh, from there. So I fix it internally probably has the most sophisticated system, but the new French system is quite good. Uh, the French system is uh, partially based on that 4554 standard uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and then the European Joint Research Center is working on this as well. If you really want to get into the weeds, there's a lot of academic literature uh, uh, out there on it that we've worked on. And then these standards are starting to come out. But at a high level, what does it mean? If you see a uh, like an iPhone, I think right now gets a 5.1 out of 10 on the French scoring system. How does that compare to the iFixit system? The French system factors in a few things that iFixit system does not. For example, it factors in parts availability and pricing. Uh, where I fix it system is purely based on mechanically, like how easy or hard is it to take apart the thing? Uh, both are valid uh, perspectives. When we're scoring product, we don't know 
what prices the manufacturers are going to sell parts for if they do at all. So we can't factor pricing into our scoring system where the French system, because it's actually scored by the manufacturers themselves, they have additional information that they can factor in. Um, so I'd say, you know, we're, we're fans of, of the French approach. Uh, we're also obviously uh, partial to our approach and we anticipate seeing, seeing more, I think. Uh, this is clearly an area where the market has not self-regulated and so you need outside incentives to come in um, and, and set the bar correctly. Uh, and a good uh, uh, model for this is Energy Star. You know, if you go into uh, Best Buy and you're gonna buy a refrigerator, uh, you have a choice and you can look and see how much energy is it going to cost me per year uh, that really, those labels really do impact customer behavior, and then they push manufacturers to do the right thing. And, and we see these repairability labelings as, as doing much the same thing. Fantastic, Kyle. Uh, we have a question here from Anika. With the action happening at the federal level for right to repair, do you think it is more important slash beneficial to focus efforts there, or do you still think individual state coalitions should keep pushing at a state level policy. Are you seeing Great question. Any... Oh, yeah. sorry. I didn't Second mean to part to it is, are you seeing any states pulling back because they've decided to wait for the federal level to address this movement instead? Great question. Uh, I'll answer the second part first. No, we haven't seen states pulling back. Uh, and I think that's because, you know, we know they know that the state governments are really kind of best positioned to tackle this. Uh, we saw the success that Right to Repair had in Massachusetts and state governments are well within their authority to regulate these practices. And you're often, you often have a better chance of making change at the state or local level than you necessarily do at the federal level. You know, you have more direct access to your state legislators. They're more Often more likely to be members of your community. Uh, and some of these companies don't have as much sway over state legislatures as they might in Congress. Uh, and, you know, passing legislation through Congress, as we can all see with the uh, continuing <laughs> debate over the infrastructure plan, um, is, is a difficult and slow endeavor. And I think, you know, states are well placed to be the pioneers here. You know, with Justice Brandeis, Supreme Court Justice, famously said the states are the laboratories for democracy. And, and that's really true. And, and I think, you know, we are continuing to focus very strongly on, on state, on our state coalitions and state legislative action. There, that said, there are some things that the federal government has to fix. Um, for example, we talked about the copyright law restrictions. Uh, that's one thing the states can't fix because copyright law, has, the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction over copyright law. So that's one thing we have to focus on at the federal level. But for the, the standard rights repair legislation, um, that's fully within state's authority. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we have a question here from Lisa. Uh, which states in the U.S. passed right to repair legislation this year? Great question. <laughs> so many good questions about right to repair legislation. Um, so this year uh, we have this year um, no states have, have passed a comprehensive right to repair legislation. So as I mentioned, Massachusetts has two right to repair laws now on the books uh, for automobiles. One passed in 2012 and one passed in 2020. Uh, but no state has fully passed a right to repair law yet. That said, we're seeing increasing momentum and success across the states. So for example, the New York State Senate passed a right to repair bill uh, uh, this year and due to kind of a quirk of timing, it didn't get through the assembly in time for it to be kind of a, a bicamerally passed piece of legislation, but we're excited for it to come back next year and we think it'll it'll have a lot of success. Um, we've also had a number of other states who are one house in the legislature passed the bill and it, it didn't get through the next house for a variety of reasons, uh, but all of this to us points to increasing momentum uh, and, and increasing success on behalf of right to repair movement in the US. Fantastic. Uh, I will want to mention as well, uh, if you do have any questions and uh, do want to uh, speak, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, I'll also say, uh, as I mentioned, that we've had, we haven't had states pass right to repair legislation yet, but you can make a difference in that. You can contact your state legislatures, uh, you can contact your representatives, and you can tell them how much, th what this means to you, and, and you can help organize uh, other folks to do the same or uh, get your local repair shops involved, uh, and you can really make a difference this way. As I said, you know, legislature, your representatives really listen to their constituents, especially at the state level. 
Yeah, th this has been, you, know, you say, why hasn't this passed yet? Well, the reason is that, the, you know, these very large corporations really don't want it to happen and they have a lot of influence. And the way that we overcome that influence in democracy is through, you know, mass joint action. Uh, and so the more visible and united we are, um, uh, the, the better chance that we got. Yeah, and these lobbyists might have a lot of power and a lot of money, but the, as I said, you know, you're you're the person responsible for making sure your representatives get reelected, right? They, the, the, these companies don't get them reelected, and so they have to listen to you, uh, and they they really are motivated to listen to their constituents. So, um, while we all might be a little bit jaded about the political process, I would say uh, contacting your state legislator legislators is is highly effective way to to help move right trip here forward. Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, gamut of information. Uh, we have a question here from Jacob. They asked, beyond individual corporations, are there specific trade associations or other organizations opposing right to repair laws? And how are you countering their arguments? <laughs> Great question. Um, so yes, there are. Um, so uh, and often the manufacturers won't show up at the at the state hearings, um, and they'll send their trade association lobbyists instead. So uh, we've seen uh, the the Consumer Technology Association (CTA) lobby very aggressively against right to repair. TechNet, which is a, a, a trade association that has members uh, including Apple. Uh, we've seen the Equipment Dealers Association, uh, which uh, represents. Uh, agricultural equipment dealers and Avamed, which represents medical uh, technology dealers. And so, you know, in all of these situations, these are trade associations, not not people. <laughs> so they're representing corporate interests and not the interests of the general populace. Uh, and their, their arguments are largely the same. Uh, as the ones that the FTC looked into. And the FTC looked at these arguments. They looked at you know, arguments that independent repair would be less safe or that it wouldn't be as good or that there would be privacy risks. And they found that none of those arguments carried water. You know, the manufacturers weren't able to support any of these arguments with any evidence or facts. Uh, and, you know, it, and in fact, you know, we're creating new problems with their repair restrictions. And so uh, the way that we counter those arguments is we say, look, you know, the FTC looked into this. They found that you were that these arguments were bogus uh, and that you know independent repair is just as safe, just as secure, just as good, uh, especially if independent repairers have access to the parts, tools, and information that manufacturers provide to their branded repair techs. And it also, you know, independent repair also saves people a lot of money. Um, there are numerous stories of folks taking uh, a great piece in the Wall Street Journal recently from Joanna Stern, uh, who took her broken laptop to the to the Apple store, the Genius Bar, and took it to an independent repair tech who who was able to fix it for, you know, $100, $200 less. Um, the same with Tesla battery packs. You know, we're seeing quotes of like $20,000 to replace a Tesla battery pack where an independent repair can fix it for $700. Um, so we're also, you know, repair, independent repair is not only good for the planet, but it's good for people's pocketbooks. It advances digital equity by making sure that uh, older devices stay functional uh, and can be uh, donated, can be sold in the secondary market, can be made available for lower prices than new tech, and can help bridge the digital divide, especially, which is especially critical in the pandemic age where we all rely on our connected devices in order to stay connected to school or work or healthcare. Fantastic. Uh, this is a comment from Peter uh, latching on to uh, Dr. Elizabeth. In uh, addition to Dr. Elizabeth's comment about right, uh, or I mean about repair cafes and fix-it clinics, uh, anyone anywhere in the world can participate in I, uh, in Fix-It Clinic's uh, virtual offerings right now, the 24-7 around the clock, around the world global fixers server and Zoom Fix-It Clinics. Hey, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Peter, excited that you're joining us. Absolutely, we agree. <laughs> Great work, Peter. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, P Peter, who asked the question, is from uh, the uh, Fix It Clinic, and uh, the uh, um, you can go. I think um, Peter maybe post in the chat where people can go to learn more uh, about Fix It Clinic and join the Fixer server. Is that on uh, the Fix It Clinic Facebook group, or where do we go to learn more? Chat is asynchronous. Um, 
but a absolutely. I mean, uh, you can go to um, uh, Repair Cafe is an international you know organization, and then there are Fix It clinics all over. Peter uh, Mui is a is a community organizer who helps run Fix It clinics in the Bay Area, Massachusetts, and elsewhere. Um, and you know, these local meetups are just fantastic. Also, we're starting to see the growth of tool libraries around the world, so that's another great way to get involved, uh, helping run or volunteering at a tool library, or even just showing up at a tool library and borrowing some tools. Fantastic. You can also contribute to guides on iFixit. That's another way to help build the repair culture. Um, as Kyle mentioned, we're a free open source uh, international repair manual for everything and all our repair guides are wikis. Uh, and so everyone can contribute uh, to write their own guides, help make our guides better, uh, submit questions and answers. And so. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Mark here. You mentioned Energy Star as a model of successful voluntary standard driving the right behavior. Do you think a voluntary approach could address right to repair uh, concerns, or do you think regulation is the only path forward in the U.S.? We've really tried the voluntary approach for a long time. We've been engaged in the, the EP standards development process is a really good example of this, uh, where uh, we engaged a, in a, you know, um, collaborative way. And what we found is that the manufacturers were not negotiating in good faith. Um, that the, the representatives that, that the manufacturers were sending to these negotiations were told not to compromise on a single iota on a single thing. Um, I'll give you an example. We had suggested, hey, uh, you know, in the green environmental standard, which is only like the top 1% best smartphones out there, let's come up with a standard set of tools that you need uh, to, that, that would be listed uh, to be able to disassemble the product. And Apple said that they would pull out of the standard entirely if their special proprietary screwdriver wasn't included on the standard list. Um, and I can give you dozens of examples like this where uh, we, we tried the, the, the friendly, uh, you know, voluntary approach and, and there is so much money on the other side and the manufacturers and design teams are unwilling to compromise that unfortunately, after a decade of trying to consensus process, uh, we're, we're looking at, at, a, at a more regulatory focused process. As we're seeing from from the French system, you know, we don't have to mandate design. All we have to do is make sure that the consumers have the information that they need uh, to make uh, the right choice. Right? The French system is not saying you can't glue a battery into a phone. What it's saying is, uh, if you do, you're going to score worse, and so maybe think about that. Um, and and really, this the market right now is just being distorted by consumers not having access to the information that they need to make the right decision. And when consumers aren't making the right decision for the environment, then manufacturers aren't incentivized to do the right thing for the environment either. And so we're in this catch-22. So by giving consumers the information that they need, I think it could really shift things. Great. Attaching to that uh, similar kind of question, uh, we have John here asking, companies like Dell have been aggressively taking back their products to repair, refurbish, and resell on their own. Does this conflict with right to repair with manufacturers trying to keep everything in house? I think that's a great question. Uh, Kyle can probably speak to Dell's practices better than I can, uh, but we do see a kind of push for um, more producer responsibility on products, uh, including you know manufacturers taking in products to repair themselves. Um, this does, you know, it doesn't necessarily conflict with right to repair, provided that those manufacturers are also making the same parts, tools, and information that they uh, provide to their own repair tax to independent repair shops and device owners. Because in a lot of circumstances, sending something back to the manufacturer is not going to be a feasible or practical way to get your devices fixed. For example, if you've got a laptop that you depend on for work or your smartphone. It, it, you're not going to be able to wait the weeks that it might take to ship a, a device back to the manufacturer for repair. Uh, and, and in some cases, you know, that delay might, might cost you money, might, you know, put your, put your life in peril. Um, and then uh, there are other reasons why this also is probably, you know, these manufacturer repair services can sometimes be more expensive. Maybe their repairs are limited. Uh, and, and really, you know, there's no reason why you as an individual should not have the right to open up your own device and fix it yourself and should not have the ability to do so. You know, it's also a fundamental autonomy issue. Um, you should have control over your devices uh, and you should be able to fix them when you want and how you want and through a repair professional of your choosing. Yeah, and I would say, uh, 
talking about Dell specifically, Dell makes service manuals available on their website for free to everyone. Dell sells repair parts to everyone. Um, so this is fantastic. This is, uh, I'm not sure that if right to repair legislation passes, Dell wouldn't need to change uh, much, if anything at all. Um, they, I, th I think, are a model of, of doing this right. Uh, in general, if you think about the repair market, what we want is options. The, the electronics repair market should operate the same way that the car repair market works. If you want to take your car down to the Ford dealer, you can. Uh, and, and they've got access to Ford information and parts. If you want to take it to a local mechanic, you can, and they've got access to Ford information and parts. And also they might, they might give you the option of, of installing aftermarket parts if you want. Um, so that's, that's what a free market needs is, is just alternatives. Um, and one thing that I would, I would mention, you know, we were talking about the trade associations that have been involved with this and we're thinking about, well, what's the difference between a state level legislation that, you know, is additional regulation, I think, there is a hesitation in the electronics recycling community to pass a whole bunch of individual state uh, laws because we're all dealing with this patchwork of 25 existing electronics recycling bills that we have. Um, two, two thoughts on that. One is uh, the Consumer Technology Association had the opportunity to get a national uh, electronics recycling bill passed and they opposed it. And that then is what catalyzed the 25 different state bills. So it's the manufacturer's fault that we have 25 different laws. There was a problem, they didn't want a national solution and so now we have a patchwork. Um, so if, if they want to uh, come to the table and negotiate on a national bill, uh, if we could go to Congress with consensus, uh, then maybe you'd, you'd see Congress passing something. Otherwise, we're going to see um, a state bill. So that, that's one. The other thing that I would mention is that we have this context with the, the Massachusetts auto right to repair law, where after Massachusetts passed the bill, the manufacturers agreed to apply the Massachusetts law nationwide in exchange for avoiding that patchwork. Um, so I think yeah, it's up to it's up to us as consumers and and players in the aftermarket to you know bring enough strength to the table to be able to, you know negotiate with the manufacturers and then it's going to be up to the manufacturers to decide if they want a patchwork of national laws or if they want to come to an agreement. Great. Uh, we have this question here from Kent asking, are there any? electronic manufacturing companies that have embraced right to repair and use it as a positive marketing delineator compared to their competition. Yeah, absolutely. I'll call out two startups, but there are some bigger companies that are doing good work as well. Uh, so in, in the, out of the Netherlands, uh, there is the company Fairphone that has a uh, easily disassembled uh, fair trade smartphone. It's a fantastic phone. I highly recommend it. Uh, Fairphone.com. You can check them out. It's amazing. Um, they include, you know, the, the screwdriver with the phone that you need to repair it. And they actually sell a, if you buy a Fairphone 3 and, and then you want to upgrade it later, they sell a camera upgrade. When's the last time you upgraded your phone? It's pretty cool. Uh, and then there's a, uh, there's a laptop startup called Framework that just started shipping this summer that is really, really cool. And it's a modular upgradable uh, laptop that is just as, as thin and sleek and sexy as, as you know, Apple's latest MacBook Pro. Um, uh, it's, it's a great device. Uh, I would also say, if you look at a lot of HP's marketing and messaging, HP is talking a lot about repairability, and they they go out of their way uh, to um, to talk about that and to I would say to work on their designs. And we're proud to work with HP behind the scenes on helping them improve repairability of their products. So, and it, there's a lot of uh, companies that are starting to move in this direction. So I, I hope next time you ask that question, I'll have even more companies to list. Fantastic! Thank you for letting us know those companies, Kyle. Uh, we have a question here <clears throat> uh, pertaining to views. So, assuming the warranty period is over, what is your view on liabilities arising post-repair? Uh, liabilities specifically regarding injury, death, and those kinds of things. Uh, so, <laughs> that, that gets into a complicated question of product liability law in the U.S. So, if there's something defective about the device, uh, if there's something defective in its manufacturer or in its design, if it comes off the production line uh, defective, then, uh, then the manufacturer uh, should be liable for those, um, for those uh, losses, um, you know, with some exceptions, and that's regardless of whether there's a warranty in place or not. Uh, if you're talking about um, liability stemming from a faulty repair. Uh, again, you know, we don't really have a lot of evidence that this happens, but in the hypothetical situation that it did, you know, there are existing liability laws and tort laws at the state at, at the state level uh, where 
where, you know, someone causes you loss or harm through negligence or recklessness, uh, they can be held liable for those losses. And I would say in general, if it's your product and, and you, you know, do something with it, you know, you, if you're, if you have a car and you change the tire on your car, uh, and you do it wrong. Uh, yeah, that's that's on you. That's not on the manufacturer. It's it's the same. It's the same across across. And uh, you know, it's important to note that that's never stopped us from you know as a, as a culture as a world from keeping people from fixing their own cars. You can still replace the tire on your car even though there is a possibility that you'll do it wrong. Uh, and and there's no re there's no reason that we should change that. You know, it's not worth the cost to tell people you can't you know replace the tires on your car. You have to take it to a dealer every time you get a flat tire because there's a one in a million chance that you're going to do it wrong and cause an accident. Um, and the same should be true with, with repair of electronic devices, which, you know, arguably pose even, even a more insignificant risk to, to any kind of health and safety than, than car repair. The dealer will probably do it wrong one out of a million times too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so be it. Uh, yeah. This is oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, and I'll reiterate, like, that, that when the FTC looked at similar arguments, they, they didn't find evidence to back up these claims that independent repair was any less safe, right? So um, I would say the concerns about uh, the safety or, or, or security of independent repair are really overblown. Fantastic. I think we're going to have one final question here, <clears throat> and it's a great question. Uh, we have Anika asking, Carrie mentioned Tesla. And made me think of this particular question. What efforts are you seeing right now with improving and expanding repair for new tech gaining popularity, particularly with solar panels, electric vehicles, etc.? While these are sustainable solutions, are they embracing repair? Or are there examples of specific companies with solar EV that are leading the way? Kyle, do you want to take that one? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we see, I, I think that there's a, a broad amount of uh, progress happening on a lot of fronts. I mean, we're excited about what's happening in the EV world. I would say all, all of these new industries kind of, you know, they, they tend to invent the product first and then figure out the repair model second. And I wish that we'd see someone coming out of the gate doing it right at the beginning. Uh, Tesla is running into all kinds of problems. They've ramped up their production and now they don't have enough repair shops to manage that. Um, uh, I see the same thing in the in the you know solar and electric world. So I think that this is something that uh, everyone is going to learn. Uh, I would encourage companies like as you start ramping up up a new product, uh, maybe hire some reverse logistics and repair experts to join you along that journey. It's a lot easier to design it in up front than it is to fix it after the fact. Absolutely, I'd say you know all the creation of new sustainable technologies is, is, is fantastic, but they need to take repair into consideration from the beginning because eventually they will break, right? Everything breaks um, and and we'll need to be able to repair them just as we need to repair everything else. And so, you know, these, uh, the laws that we're talking about, the policies we're talking about would impact manufacturers of solar tech or um, uh, wind energy or electric vehicles, just the same as they would everyone else, because the issues are the same. You know, we need access to parts, tools, and information to keep them running and keep our future sustainable. Great. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about repair and things breaking down, we're talking about the second law of thermodynamics. Like the moment you make something, it starts breaking down. You can't make something not to break. It's going to break. It's simply a question of when it breaks, is it destined for the dump or are there alternate pathways? Great. Um, I'll have Prima here yeah. wrap things up for us. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Those were great questions. Great participation, indeed. And thank you, Kyle, Liz, and Kerry for the great session. And uh, if any of your questions are not answered, and if you have more questions, please feel free to write to us. You can write to eastwards at info at eastwards.org or to me, that's Prema at e-stewards.org and we will try and answer those questions for you. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you once again. Just a reminder, this will be available coming to you via email, this video. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks.